we've done the questions. We go to Attorney General now. <coughs> okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Right, we now come to questions to the Attorney General. We start with Chiam Um Question number one, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Minister. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. With uh, your permission, I will answer questions 1, 4 and 9 uh, together. Uh, the Crown Prosecution Service and the Serious Fraud Office play a critical role in bringing economic criminals to justice. Uh, indeed, this month, the Serious Fraud Office had charged two company directors with fraud in relation to a Carly scheme into which hundreds of British savers paid around pounds. Jim Warren. The Horizon Post Office scandal has appalled the nation. Hundreds of sub-postmasters wrongly prosecuted, convicted, many jailed, or else entirely innocent of any fraud. COVID-19 fraud, on the other hand, is known. It is real. Estimates put it as high as 16 billion, and yet we haven't clawed back a fraction of what have been stolen. Why were the innocent left to rot for so long while the guilty go free to enjoy the fruits of their COVID crime? So, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right about the appalling uh, miscarriage of justice, uh, and I agree entirely with everything she said with regards to Horizon and Post Office, and as she knows, the steps are being taken uh, to address that uh, and work on goes on that. With regards to COVID uh, crime, of course, uh, both the Attorney General and I meet regularly with the SFO and with the CPS in order to, uh, you know, to press for action on whatever uh, is the pressing issue of the day, and indeed, the CPS have brought a number of individuals and charged a number of individuals with relation to the precisely the fraudulent activities she refers to. Tim Law. The Solicitor General will be aware that the Home Affairs Select Committee is currently looking at the whole issue of fraud and finding a huge problem, everything from romance fraud to fraud financing uh, terrorism. And clearly there's a, an urgent need for much better joined up working between agencies and information sharing in this country, but also on the international front as well. So what discussions has he had and what experiences has he got of which nations prosecute fraud rather more effectively than we do in this case. Well, the Honourable Gentleman raises an excellent point, and I commend him for his work on the Home Affairs Select Committee and look forward to the results of that work, which we will consider uh, very carefully. Uh, so both I and the Attorney General meet regularly with the SFO and with the CPS uh, to uh, assess best practice, to see where lessons may be learned. We do that both internally and with regards to best practice uh, from uh, abroad. There is intelligence sharing that goes on in any event between the relative agencies, and we will look to see what lessons can be learned both from best practice here and abroad to take forward the points he raises. And this law to... Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the past five years, law enforcement agencies, including the CPS, Proceeds of Crime Unit, have confiscated £568 million from criminals. They get to keep a tiny percentage of recovered assets and virtually no fines to help them continue their work. Why is the government enfeebling the very organisation it relies on to win the fight against economic crime? Why will they not adopt Labour's invest to save model of enforcement? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, firstly, I commend the work uh, of the enforcement agencies who have rightly uh, cracked down on the fraudulent activity he refers to. Um, he's right that the government has tirelessly pursued uh, criminals with a view to recouping, uh, to prevent them from, uh, from benefiting from uh, their ill gotten gains. And of course, uh, amongst a number of the positive outcomes of that have been £105 million pounds which have been returned to victims. Christine Jardine. Much, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the Minister um, for his, his details about what is happening, but since the pandemic, fraud has cost the public purse more than £21 billion, much of that related to the government's own schemes. And you can understand public resentment, because at the same time, uh, prosecution for fraud and money laundering has gone down by more than 50 per cent since 2010. So would the Minister agree with me that the time has come for more action and that perhaps we should seriously consider an economic crime fighting fund to reinvest seized assets and profits into improving law enforcement against fraud. Well, the Honourable Lady is quite right. This is a matter of huge public concern, and understandably so. Government worked very hard during the pandemic to ensure support was provided. Uh, but clearly, where people have uh, taken advantage of a system, that must be pursued. Uh, that's why we're looking at things like there's a fraud strategy, for example. There's also an economic uh, uh, crime plan, point two, as it were, which we're looking at. So we will continue to drive forward to see what further action can be taken. Dr. Neil Hudson. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. In terms of fraud, every day older and vulnerable people are preyed upon by fraudsters and scammers, be it online, by phone or on doorstepping. Can my honourable friend reassure my constituents, the country, that the Conservative government, the police and the criminal justice system will do all it can to bring these immoral criminals to justice? Speaker, yes, I can. I mean, the Honourable Gentleman is quite right to draw attention to this. This is one of the great issues of our age, as people uh, who are taken advantage of, and it happens to all members of society, in fact, but particularly those, Mr Speaker, who are elderly and who are vulnerable. Um, there is a number of sector char uh, charters under which work continues on this. Uh, this has been successful in bringing forward a number of positive outcomes. Uh, for example, 870 million um, scam texts have been blocked. Uh, we've taken forward work under the Online Safety Act uh, as well, as well as the charters that I've referred to, but yes, I can assure the honourable gentleman we will continue to, do, see, to see what more can be done. Shadow Minister Carl Turner. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's two years since the former counter fraud minister resigned in embarrassment at the government oversight of COVID business loan schemes, describing it as nothing less than woeful. So can the Solicitor General tell us, in the last two years, how much of the missing billions, seemingly written off by the Prime Minister as Chancellor, have been recovered, and what is the Government doing now to chase down the Covid crooks? Uh, again, Mr Speaker, I know the gentleman was quite right to draw attention to this. The public quite rightly expect that the money that government has advanced in good faith to help those who are challenged during the pandemic ought not to be uh, the victim of fraudulent activity. He's quite right. Um, so intelligence sharing goes on between the activities, between the SFO, who, as he knows, prosecute the most uh, serious. The CPS have brought a number of in individuals and charged them already. We will continue to do that both from our perspective and with the law enforcement agencies to make sure that the crooks that he refers to are pursued. Christine. Number two, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to assure the House that the Government respects its international obligations. The Law Officers Convention prevents me from disclosing outside Government whether I've given advice or even whether, um, what the context of any such advice might be. The bill that the Honourable Gentleman refers to is currently in the other place and will be discussed very fully there, I'm sure. Chris Stevens. Mr Speaker, just this week we heard media reports that four Rwandans have been granted refugee status in the UK in the last four months, citing well-founded fears of persecution. At the same time, the government would like us to accept that Rwanda is a safe country, despite the Home Office accepting these individuals face a real threat of persecution. So can the Attorney General tell us, how can we send asylum seekers to Rwanda in these circumstances? We are asking Parliament to look at the matter afresh, not just to look at the matter, um, the, the facts as they were before the Supreme Court, but to look at new circumstances. And evidence was published on the 11th of January to assist Parliament in those deliberations. We have assurances from the Government of Rwanda that the implementation of all measures within the treaty will be expedited, and we will ratify the treaty when we're ready to do so. We now come to SNP spokesperson Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Journalists and bloggers who criticise the government arrested, threatened, put on trial with allegations of torture, disappearances, and suspicious deaths. These are just some of the issues that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have reported on in Rwanda. Is the Attorney General genuinely comfortable? when asking Parliament to disregard established legal principles such as the burden of proof and the need for evidence in passing the Rwanda Bill? Yeah, yeah. I, Mr Speaker, I do think it is constitutionally proper for Parliament to legislate in response to a decision of the Supreme Court. We do it all the time in the finance and tax space. Um, Lord Reid was careful to point out to the Constitutional Committee in the other House that we did it following the Burma Royal case in the War Damage Act. In this case, I would urge the Honourable Lady to look hard at the evidence that the Government has put before the House on the 11th of January. Everyone must treat Rwanda, if the Bill passes, as generally safe for the transfer of these individuals under the treaty. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Rupert Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number three, please. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will answer three and eight together. 
We are steadily increasing the number of rape cases sent to the Crown Court. We are preparing to launch a joint justice plan which will transform how the police and the CPS investigate and prosecute <coughs> domestic abuse cases. And if I may, Mr Speaker, I'd like to welcome my friend Andre Costin. I think not quite here because his plane hasn't arrived, but in my office after um, questions, who is the Ukrainian Prosecutor General. The relevance of that is a team of UK experts is supporting his office to investigate and prosecute cases of conflict-related sexual violence in Ukraine. Dr. Rupert Hope. Last July, the Solicitor General told this House in an answer to the member for Strangford that a new violence against women and girls strategy for 2023 to 25 would be published later this year. That year has come and gone, as has that minister. So could the Attorney General tell us what the status of this strategy is, content, who they are consulting and when it will be published? Yes, I know the Honourable Lady takes a, a long-term interest in these affairs and she and I have discussed this for many years. Um, I, I would like to reassure the Honourable Lady that a great deal of work has been done. The work in the rape sphere, which I referenced in my earlier answer, is now really very commendable. We, after having a really difficult time in prosecuting rapes for many years, we now are back up to 2016 levels and indeed exceeding them. The Joint Justice Plan, which will aim to build on the rape work, in the domestic abuse sphere will be ready very shortly. We're saying in the spring, but I think only a few weeks. The Honourable Lady will have to wait. Dame Diana Johnson. Um, the Home Affairs Select Committee carried out an inquiry into the investigation and prosecution of rape. And we were very clear, and one of our recommendations was, that police forces need to have the specialist units to investigate rape, for them then to, pro to proceed on to the CPS and to hopefully get to uh, court. We know that you get better decision making, you get better communication with victims and the CPS if you have those specialist officers. Is the Attorney General as surprised as I am that not all police forces have those specialist units to deal with rape and sexual assaults? Well, the Honourable Lady who does sterling work on the Home Affairs Select Committee knows that the police are not directly under my supervision. But what I am very proud to talk about is the very close cooperation between the police and the CPS specialists in this field, which has really helped, together with some great granularity and pushing on the statistics, to drive up those rape prosecutions. And in her area, Yorkshire and Humberside, I, I believe, um, she will be glad to know that the number of suspects charged with rape has increased significantly over the course of the last year. Paul Hull. Uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my, my new Naples constituent, Zoe McGill, suffered the appalling crime of knife crime when her son, Jack Woolley, was killed in 2021. She is now suffering again as one of the perpetrators is using social media from custody to glorify himself. Would the Attorney General agree with me that actions like these should be prosecuted, consequences should be publicised to make sure they become a deterrent against others glorifying themselves from our prisons? Man highlights a really horrific case. This is why it's so important that we crack down on mobile phone use and indeed mobile phone existence within prisons. The government, I know, has put in £100 million to make sure that prisons now have airport style security to make sure that phones really uh, it's much more difficult for them to get in it's very serious when incidents such as this happened and i commend the honourable gentleman for raising it here and his constituent zoe and indeed the northern echo who i understand have been campaigning on this issue thank you mr speaker uh, number five Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Serious Fraud Office has brought um, no prosecutions for cases of fraud connected with COVID-19. The SFO only deals with the most complex and serious economic crime, and so the vast majority of such cases would not fall within its remit. The SFO works closely with other law enforcement agencies to ensure intelligence is shared and any investigations are handled by the most appropriate agency. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Staggering to hear the uh, Minister refer to this as not serious or imply that it's not serious. In 2023, the level of fraud reported by HMRC in two COVID-19 financial support schemes sat between $3.3 billion and $7.3 billion, with less than a billion of this being recovered. Considering the UK government has already written off an alarming $8.7 billion it spent on protective equipment bought during the pandemic, will the Minister commit to routinely publishing accounts including the number of prosecutions and the cost of recovery for COVID-19 contracts and support schemes? Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman uh, misunderstands the point I'm making. The SFO deals with the most complex uh, of schemes. I'm not, uh, not for a second would I have suggested that any such fraud to which he refers is not serious. Of course it's serious. Um, but the vast majority of the crimes to which he alludes to would be dealt with by the CPS, and indeed the CPS have taken forward and have charged a number of individuals with precisely the sorts of crimes that he refers to. Bob Black. I have regular meetings with the Director of Public Prosecutions. His priorities align very closely with those of the government's, namely tackling delays, combating violence against women and girls, enhancing our work with victims and driving improvement across the system. Bob Blackman. Again, I thank my right old friend uh, for that answer. It appears that almost every week on our streets we are seeing hate-filled demonstrations with anti-Semitism rife yet no action yeah, yeah. seems to be taken. And yeah. now we've seen the end result of that in that my honourable friend, the member for Finchley and Golders Green, yeah. has announced his decision to leave this place yeah. because of anti-Semitism yeah. and the threats yeah. against his person. Yeah. Will my yeah. right honourable friend take up with the CPS to make sure that this is the last case of this and that anti-Semitism is prosecuted properly in the way it should? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well the Honourable Gentleman raises a very important and serious matter. I would like to reassure him that I have been working very closely with the CPS, who in turn are extremely close to the police in, uh, when working to deal with these very significant issues. The CPS have been embedded in the control rooms during the most serious of the marches that have taken place. I would like to reassure the Honourable Gentleman that a large number of prosecutions have already started. Most of the ones that have come to conclusion are necessarily guilty pleas because prosecutions take time. But we are just starting to enter the phase, as, as we all saw very sadly, a large uptick in this horrible crime after October the 7th last year. We're just starting to get to the phase where trials are beginning, where people have not pleaded guilty. And I hope that the Honourable Gentleman will take some reassurance from this answer, and I hope that he'll come and see me so that I can talk him through some of the work that we're doing. Thank you so much, Mr Speaker. Does the uh, Attorney General agree with me that a key priority for the CPS must be about fixing the flawed way joint enterprise laws are used? And does she agree that no one should ever be convicted of a crime that they made no significant contribution to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know the Honourable Lady is a long-time campaigner on joint enterprise, and I also know that the Lord Chancellor, um, my dear friend in this place, has also considered these matters very carefully. Very Glynn. Number seven, Mr Speaker. I have always been clear that the rule of law is fundamental to our constitution and it is the duty of the law officers to uphold it. As I emphasised in my speech at the Institute of Government last summer and in my appearance at the House of Lords Constitution Committee, I take this duty very seriously indeed. I not only engage with colleagues across government but also students and other young people to ensure that the rule of law is protected not just now but for generations to come. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Horizon scandal has raised many important legal questions, ranging from the reliance on flawed evidence to the slow pace of the justice system to correct miscarriages of justice. But can the Attorney General now address the implications for the power of organisations like the Post Office to pursue private prosecutions and, in particular, what oversight the CPS can or should have over the use of those powers? I thank the Honourable Lady for her serious question. 
Please, um, I would like the Honourable Lady to rest assured that these are matters which are being considered very carefully within government. The immediate priority is to take bold and novel action to, insofar as we can, right the wrongs that have come about through the Horizon scandal. But a slower time, but nevertheless urgent piece of work, is to make sure that private prosecutions are sufficiently scrutinised and inspected in the future. Sir Mike Lellis. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable and learned friend agree with me that the leaking of law officer advice for political or any other purposes is not only a breach of the very important law officers' convention respecting the confidentiality of legal advice, but is also damaging to the public interest and contrary to the rule of law? The right honourable and learned gentleman makes an characteristically significant intervention. He will know very well, having served both as Solicitor General and Attorney General, the importance of the Law Officers' Convention to the working of government. Legal professional privilege generally is a very, very important um, construct, and it is something on which the client relationship really relies. In government, this is, if anything, even more significant. And when law officers' advice is leaked, this has a chilling effect on our ability to provide free and frank and honest um, advice to the rest of government. It is something I wholeheartedly deplore, and I agree with everything he said. Shall yeah. Attorney General Emily Bombray. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, we have all read with deep concern last week's interim ruling from the International Court of Justice regarding the situation in Gaza. And on this side of the House, we are absolutely clear that Hamas must release all remaining hostages immediately, that Israel must comply with the ICJ's orders in full, that the, court, that the judgment of the court must be treated with respect, and that all parties must comply with international law as part of an immediate humanitarian truce and a sustainable ceasefire. So can I ask the Attorney General very simply, does she agree with me on all those points, and is it the official position of the government both to accept the authority of the court in this matter, and even more importantly, to urge Israel to accept the authority of the court as well, and to implement its orders in full as a matter of urgency? The Right Honourable Lady is right to call for international humanitarian law to be respected and civilians to be protected in Gaza, and I join her in that call. We are deeply concerned about the impact of what is happening on the civilian population in Gaza. Too many have been killed, and we want to see Israel take greater care to limit its operations to military targets. We regularly review Israel's commitment to IHL, and we all call in this House, I believe, for an immediate pause, which will allow, allow aid to get in and hostages to come out. That completes question.